Hi, this is Robert Wright. One thing I like about the conversations I have here on The Wright Show is that they help me think and write. They've informed the books and many of the articles I've written over the past 15 years. Now, lately, most of my writing has been for my newsletter, the Non-Zero Newsletter. It covers the kinds of topics you see on the show. Politics, foreign policy, psychology, philosophy, spirituality, how to avoid the apocalypse, things like that. So if you enjoy The Right Show, chances are pretty good that you'll enjoy the newsletter. It's free, and all you have to do to get it is go to nonzero.org and sign up. So I suggest that you hit pause, go sign up, and then hit play. Thanks. Hi, Jacqueline. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm glad you could find the time to join us. I'm really excited about this conversation. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is a Wright Show available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Jacqueline Novogratz, if I got that right. You got it perfectly. Why, thank you. Um, and you have uh, just written a book that I just finished listening to um, on Audible called Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Practices to Build a Better World. Uh, and I guess there are a few reasons I'm looking forward to the conversation. One is that I am in favor of uh, moral revolutions. I'm interested in having you talk more about the kind that you want to see and, and how you're going to uh, help us bring it about. Uh, but also the book has a lot of, uh, stories in it, uh, that are, that are interesting and they're relevant to the fact that you are the founder and CEO of Acumen, which is what best described as a, what, a nonprofit investment fund or, a, or an impact investment organization or what? What's the? Yeah, really either. We essentially take the right kind of capital. We invest it in the right kind of character, uh, surrounded with the right community for change. Okay. And you do that in lots of parts of the world, um, you know, Africa, South Asia, and 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 so on. So there are a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot including of inter- the U.S. Including the U.S. Now, yeah, there's a, there's a story from Harlem, I think, in the book, mm. unless I'm mistaken. So, um, so we'll we'll talk about uh, some of the some of the changes you've helped happen around the world. Um, and then there's a there's a third thing I like about the book, which is it's also to some extent the kind of the overarching story of your personal development, uh, how you you know came to found Acumen and how your own thinking has developed along the way. And I'd like to just start out a little um, by by talking a little about your personal story. Um, so you and I have something in common. Our fathers were military officers. Yours was in the army as well, right? Like mine. Yeah. Okay, so military family. We had only f- five children. I'm ashamed to say you had you win the trophy <laughs> with seven. Tiny, tiny family, Bob. Catholic by any chance? A little Catholic. Uh huh. How about you? No, that's why we stopped at five. Southern Baptist, uh, not Catholic. Um, so that is um interesting. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't have guessed that you came from a military family if I was told, um what you do for a living and and what you've created it now that i've heard the story though it makes a little more sense um you were for one thing you 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 kind of had uh entrepreneurship ingrained in you uh from early on uh is that there's a story you tell about levi's um yeah i mean it's interesting thinking about now in this time of covid and how resources resource constraint actually allows for freedom and and innovation. And so when we were little kids, my mother was a great tribe, tribal builder and myth maker. Hmm. And so um, there were really only two distinguishing brands in the 1970s, Levi's and Converse sneakers. I don't know if it was the same in the South. Um, Well, we, I mean, we were, you know, because my father was in the military. uh, I mean, this really, this really rang a bell for me. You're talking about this and and I'll explain why, uh, but, but, um, uh, but go ahead and tell, tell us how Levi's and Converse sneakers are relevant to your. So, you know, we came home from school and we were like, mom, you've got to buy us Levi's and Converse or we're going to be uncool. Mm -hmm. And my mother would look at us scornfully and be like, you don't need brand names. You know, you're Novogratz's. And um, if you want 
the fancy jeans or the fancy sneakers, I'll make a deal with you. I will get, I will give you the money that I would have paid for the PX or the, the post, post exchange, post exchange on the military base. You pay the difference. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I was 10 years old and I was selling door to door, had a paper route. I was constantly working and essentially creating little companies. Uh, and it was years later that my brothers and I looked at each other and were like, what were Novogratz's? <laughs> <laughs> but she is convinced <laughs> we didn't we had no need for brands so you made up the difference of wore the levi's we did got yeah. those levi's got those converse now did they not sell levi's in the px because maybe i was privileged what i remember and this is almost exactly the same time i think but we were in san francisco on the presidio and maybe that's why our px actually had levi's and what i remember is there was such a steep discount at the px i mean you know you got stuff really cheap at the px that we could afford to buy levi's and some kids at school at the public school in san francisco couldn't and they 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 envied and admired me for my levi's that is so funny i'm thinking that was san francisco um and also remember i mean and you look at where income inequality is now compared to when we were growing up Mm -hmm. a few dollars was everything especially if you had lots of kids um and so i don't remember levi's being at the the px Hmm. but um I do know that that was the deal we all mm. had to live with. Now, what I couldn't get was Adidas. Uh, th- th- those were a, a great above converse. Anyway, I, I digress. So, so, um, and your mo- was your mother herself an entrepreneur? D- did she? You know, in, in ways, again, I think resource constraints. Um, my mother is a myth maker and a quintessential saleswoman and storyteller. Hmm. And so... The way she made ends meet in our family was to sell antiques, and she still does. And literally, I would get home. I came home from school one day, and my bed was gone. Um, I was like, where is it? She's like, I got a good deal. Don't worry. So she was always selling something in our house. And I think, Bob, that that actually, you meet any of the seven of us, and we don't have a lot of attachment um, to things like that even though we all love beauty, which she also loved. So it's funny, but yes. So I'd call her entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. Um, technically worked at home, was a housewife, but ma'am, was she always selling something? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so I can understand how you uh, came to be somebody who could create a large uh, organization, I guess. And, and of course you started out in the private sector in banking, but, but uh, just for a few years, but yes, yeah. the, the, um, so then the other uh, – another thing that leapt out at me, um, uh, maybe this is the main other ingredient we need to explain your your ultimate trajectory aside from having an entrepreneurial bent, was the thing about uh, saints becoming your role models at an early age? Yeah. Um, I mean early, like six. Mm-hmm. Dad was in Vietnam, went to a Catholic school. Um, very much interested, even as a little girl in the world. And, um, you know, when you got good grades, uh, perfect exams, exactly. Um, my sister, Mary Theophane, the nun would give us these little cards with stories of the saints. And I was fascinated by them. And it was really only lately that the, the poet Marie Howe, who's become a friend said, you know, Jacqueline, um, saints were the first stories we read of women who told the stories of their own lives. And, um, and I just, everything started to click for me when Marie said that, because hmm. I was kind of teased, you know, well, I um, would read these stories of the saints and I was obsessed not only with their goodness, but in ways, their, their ferocity. Mm-hmm. Well, they were really the first people who were fighters for social justice, often at the price of their lives. Mm-hmm. And so when I really reflected on it, Bob, I realized that they were the first human beings I encountered who committed to an idea that was bigger than they were and uh, not only lived their lives, but in some ta- some cases were willing to die for those ideas. Hmm. That's amazing. Um, and you've actually encountered a certain amount of physical risk. It sounds like in the, in the course of your, your, uh, your own eventual uh, travels, you, 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 you have a few a few brushes with um with violence around the world, but uh, you're you survived in good shape. I have I have lost some very very dear friends, um, 
who stood up to the status quo and, and lost their lives for it. And I think that was one of the big lessons for me, even as a young woman in my 20s, uh, to realize just how solid the status quo can be and that it's actually um, – we, we sometimes think of, oh, those kids who go over to do good in the world, and we have no idea, nor do they often, that mm-hmm. trying to make change can be a uh, very hardcore business. Mm-hmm. And so you have to learn to play hardball as well as to hold the the moral and the good. And so you mean you've lost friends in some of these these countries around the world where, where Acumen has done work? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, our office, a number of the offices within our office are named for people you would never hear of, but that um, had a huge impact on my life and uh, whose lessons I've integrated into the work of Acumen. Hmm. And, and I mean, don't go any deeper than you want to, but this was violence at the hands of a government or a very... Uh, it depended. Uh, in some cases, government. Um, in some cases... And, 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 and that's where I think one of the great advantages of getting old, um, is life comes full circle often. And so there was a woman named Ingrid Rashinawatak, who I actually write about in my first book, um, who was a fellow. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, which is called the, the blue sweater, we should say. With blue people, sweater. To people who want to Google it. And she was the leader of the Menominee Nation, um, mm-hmm. in, in a Native American nation in the United States. And was actually down working with the Uwa tribe in northern Colombia um, in an area that the FARC or the revolutionary um, guerrillas of Colombia. Um, and it was a big mistake. Um, and they kidnapped her. Uh, and goodness, I don't know how things got out of control, but she was with two other activists hmm. and ultimately tortured and killed. And by, by FARC. By FARC. Mm-hmm. Probably, you know, 14, 15 year old boys. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, in the Rwandan genocide, I lost a number of, mm. not just, I lost many friends. And in all cases, I saw that people doing very good things for the right reasons were sometimes in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, uh, and I think that's been part of what's also fueled me to do more and try mm-hmm. to be more. And keep their spirits alive. Okay, so why don't you talk a little about the point at which you started to make the transition from kind of conventional banking? So you'd been to you went to UVA and then what to Stanford Business School? You you no, I actually went from UVA right into banking. You did. You didn't go to you didn't go to business school. Uh, no, I had no. I, I see. In fact, I was an accidental banker. Um, but I, you know, as a military kid, had never traveled, was desperate to know the world. And uh, my parents made me do the interview process. And so I put my resumes into the boxes for economics and foreign affairs majors. Had an interview with Chase Manhattan Bank, which I was very confused by, but went mm-hmm. because I told my parents I would. The guy says to me, tell me, Miss Novogratz, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, well, actually... I don't want to be a banker. My parents are making me do this interview. If I had been there, I could have given you some advice. Exactly. Never tell someone like this you don't want to do the job. But anyway, it seems to have worked out. You know, well, I mean, it's that mix of of real authenticity, which I think I've held. On the other hand, Moxie, because when he said, well, I'm really sorry about that, because if you got this job, you'd be in 40 countries over the next three years. And I was like, "Uh, do you think that we could start this interview over? And um, I literally left the room, came back in and uh, reintroduced myself. He said, tell me, Ms. Novogratz, why do you want to be a banker? I said, ever since I was six years old, all I ever wanted to be was a banker. And um, So you did this as kind of a joke? You said, well, let me start all over. And you like left the room and came back? It was kind of a mix between a Hail Mary pass and a joke. Mm -hmm. And the guy, he went there with me. I got the job. I was in 40 countries. And those countries included... Interesting to think about it now, but a lot of Latin American countries during a period of hyperinflation, which I worry the world will go into soon again as we print all this money. And so I saw economy spinning out of control. I saw the elites protecting themselves 
And I saw the poor completely excluded from the financial system and economic opportunity. Hmm. And that was really the beginning for me, Bob, was, okay, now it's time for me to explore whether we can use the tools of banking because I loved the tools. I loved how numbers told a story um, and try to find a way to make it accessible to low-income people and see what could happen. And that was the beginning for me. Now, was this about the time that micro lending was getting a lot of attention as a, as a new successful thing? It still hadn't gotten attention. This was 1985, 86. Um, Muhammad Yunus had started the Grameen Bank in 80, in 76. So things moved more slowly than they do now without mm-hmm. the internet and interconnectedness. But I read a tiny article about him and what he was doing. And I said, this is what I got to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to get myself to do it. And, um, and then it's a long story that lands me in Rwanda and I helped start the first microfinance bank. Okay. And the idea behind microfinance is, is I gather that in the developing world, uh, relatively small loans can make a big difference if they're well-placed. I mean, that's part of the idea, right? How would you describe the philosophy? Yeah, I would describe it differently today than I would have 30 years ago. Um, What I've come to understand now is that the poor, it's really expensive to be poor. The poor tend to pay a lot more for things we take for granted. The beginning for me was credit. And so in the developing world, even now, Um, And frankly, in the United States, too, if you think about payday lending, low-income people can pay 300 400% per year for a loan that somebody else might pay 15% for. Mm -hmm. Right now, payday lending is about 300% a year in the United States. Um, And so microfinance was really an introduction to me of what it would mean to um, cut that down to an affordable price for low-income people. But the only way you could do it so that you were compensating for risk was for people who had no collateral, which is the way traditional banking works, right? Mm -hmm. I'll take collateral, then I know if I lend you money, I have a better chance of getting it back. Mm -hmm. Michael, you don't have collateral. You make $2 a day. But what I can do is, is come to you in a group, and we will be each other's collateral. So if I come in with five women and you give us a loan, when one of us doesn't pay, none of us get another loan. And so we now have a system in place of mutual support that will make us repay. So these are all women who, who live, they are in the country that, that you're working in and, and they, they know each other or, or, or you, you bring them together? or They form groups. They come in. And, and they get loans. On and they a, may do, they may have different enterprises. They all have different enterprises. They would each get, let's say $30 would be your mm-hmm. average starting loan. And then the more they repay, the more they've now developed a credit record and the more they can borrow bigger and bigger amounts. Okay. And that was the original theory. Now it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar, you know, I think it's a 60 or a hundred billion dollar industry, but then. Mm-hmm. Um, there were four little microfinance organizations. And is the idea that, um, you know, you're sufficiently careful that on balance, these things make money? Uh, in other words, um, or is it that, well, you can only be so careful and it is, you know, a part of the world where things are uncertain, you're going to lose money. So you get a certain amount of philanthropic input. I mean, you go around and get people to, you know, get get philanthropists to donate and, or, 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 or what? What, is, what exactly is the expectation? Well, so this is where it really connects to acumen because, which was 20 years after, you know, those first, that mm-hmm. first foray into Rwanda or 15 years after. So you founded acumen in, in 2001. You? Okay. So, and this is, let's say, 86. So this was early days of building a new sector for the poor that had never existed before, except for traditional money lenders. Mm-hmm. So you needed philanthropy. Uh, because no one knew what they were doing. We didn't know how much interest to charge. We didn't know the poor didn't have any infrastructure. There was no infrastructure in the, the systems themselves. And remember, in the nonprofit sector, there's very little money for research and development. 
um, Mm -hmm. unlike in the corporate sector. And so um, what I learned from all of that is the poor pay a lot more, not only for credit, but for water. They might pay 60 times in slums Mm -hmm. for drinking water than their counterparts would pay, than you or I would pay if we rented an apartment in Nairobi. Hmm. 60 times. Hmm. Um, healthcare, uh, you don't even get healthcare unless you can pay up front in many of the places in which we work. Education, technically it's free in many of the places in which we work, but that means ghost schools exist because the government gets stuck with you know, local politicians and mafias, et cetera, et cetera. Teachers don't show up. There are no schools. So you've got a big mess on your hands, and yet low-income people want the same things that anybody else wants, and they're willing to pay if that good, whether it's credit or water or healthy health or housing, is provided to them in ways that they value and can afford. And mm-hmm. that was the beginning of Acumen that came out of my understanding from microfinance that you can do this in a way that low-income people can value and afford and pay you back in microfinance at much higher rates than the wealthy were paying back their loans. And so to your question, now, all these years later, the markets have taken over and microfinance is an area in which people can make money. But at the beginning days, uh, the market needed to be created. Hmm. And that's what Acumen does. We create markets by using different kinds of capital, philanthropy, patient capital, and investment capital to build companies that serve the poor in ways that they can afford and value. Okay. And you clearly focus on areas where you will actually increase uh, human well-being in important ways. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I gather. I mean, you're, you're selective. There, there are ways you could make money in some of these places that you're just not interested in. Well, in all of these areas in which we operate, I often say that the poor are stuck between the cheats and the charities. Um, there are there are what's called mafias that will deliver you water, as I said, at mm-hmm. 60 times what the rich pay, um, taking advantage of the fact that you're excluded and that you need it to survive. Because the government is just not serving you at all in this capacity. Not in, this, not in the places that we work. Mm-hmm. Or if they do, it's in a very inefficient way. So mm-hmm. off-grid energy, you, you, take a, a, you take something like electricity. Until 2007, um, 1.5 billion people in the world had no electricity whatsoever. None. Over the next years, governments were starting to extend the grid. Um, but typically, even if someone technically has access in rural areas, low-income rural areas, the grid might work a couple hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so um, access and quality are not the same things. And that is why we have looked for um, more both economically and socially viable ways of delivering critical services so that the poor can essentially be the ones to decide for their lives. Okay, so ele- uh, electricity is a good example. I mean, that's a um, you one of the uh, companies you backed, I guess, made. I mean, back when solar lighting was kind of a newer a newer thing, they made solar lanterns, right? And 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 this was I forget where this is, but it's somewhere where people had been using kerosene lamps. Yeah, which is really all over the developing world, but in Africa particularly, mm-hmm. and for kerosene lamps. You know, you and I remember because we saw those stories of the 19th century, you know, a hurricane lantern that was right. the way that America lit its home until the the beginning of the 20th century, essentially. And so um, 125, 30 years later, with a billion and a half people still consigned to kerosene, which is dirty, expensive, highly polluting, um, we had no solutions. Um, Or at least we thought we didn't. Uh, And even solar at that point was pretty expensive. It was like $4 a watt. But these two young guys, um, Sam Goldman and Ned Tozem, they had what we call moral imagination. This starts to get to the moral. Mm -hmm. They had this, this idea that they were going to find a way to eradicate kerosene. 
they also knew that they'd never built a business and they didn't really know if anybody was going to buy their solar lantern. Um, but they had such guts. They had such a sense of character that we took a bet on them. So then Acumen comes in with our patient capital, which is philanthropy, but we invest it as long-term equity. We actually buy shares in the business, um, knowing that we're in for 10 to 15 years. And we accompany the, the, the entrepreneurs with talent and connections to other corporations and design firms. And, um, and we go through the ups and downs of what it actually takes to build a new market, something I learned through microfinance. And now 13 years later, that company has brought light and electricity to 100 million low-income people around the world. Um, these two young guys have truly changed the world. And because of them, we learned how to invest. We've become the biggest off-grid energy investor in the world. And um, a whole ecosystem developed where there are probably 500 off-grid energy companies. So think tiny companies bringing um, home systems where you put a 10 to 50 watt solar panel on your hut and that will give you three lights, a radio, and a cell phone charger. Um, and you go in one day from living in the 19th century to being anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, and for a small upgrade, you can get a flat screen television, nine watt. Mm-hmm. And so it's truly mind-blowing when you see what we can do. And then you see the choices we make not to do. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, moral imagination there. That is one of the big themes in the book. Do you want to um, talk Say what about what, what you mean by that? Yeah. Yes. So what I mean in, in first in lofty terms and then in more pragmatic terms, because we say it all the time, which is it's the humility to see the world as it is. In other words, to recognize all the ugly around um, the realities that you have to work with, but not letting go of the audacity to imagine what could be. And so the, the steps, the four steps, if you will, to put moral imagination into practice would be to start with empathy. But these days I hear so many corporations say all it takes is empathy, and that's a big fat lie. Empathy by itself reinforces the status quo. It enables inaction. We just feel sorry for people, but we don't do anything. So empathy has to be driven by curiosity. Um, and that should lead to what we call immersion or proximity to the problem so that you can actually understand a problem from the people who you want to serve's perspective. Designed from that. Um, third, understand the systemic forces around that problem. And fourth, act. Um, and so it's a very muscular idea, the moral imagination, and I've seen it transform industries um, in ways that are inclusive, not just of low-income people, but take the earth and um, and climate into consideration. Mm-hmm. Um, is there such a thing as too much empathy? Yes. Um, I, um, I talk about it a lot with young people on the team, the risk of over-empathy. I had it myself. You, you are an, a diagnosed empath? I'm a diagnosed empath, but I got a hard edge. And the more people know me, the more they see um, I may lead with curiosity and empathy, but then there is a line. If you cross it, you just hit steel. And so, um, and maybe it's because I learned early on. I, I, helped, I When I started the microfinance bank, I also... I wanted to understand, talk about proximity and, and immersion. I wanted to actually understand how to build a business. One of the reasons I started Acumen is that I realized that with microfinance, the assumption was that people were entrepreneurs and they would create all these jobs. And what I learned is that most people want a job. Um, they don't want to have to be entrepreneurs. It's easier. <laughs> it's a lot easier. And so that's what's been so extraordinary about Acumen's work by solving our big problems, we've created, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs through all these different companies. But the, um, but the, so I go off and I decide I'm going to start a bakery so I can learn what does it actually take to start a company. 
That's mm-hmm. when I understood why it's so hard. So why you, you people- actually did start a bakery in 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 this, Rwanda. In, in Rwanda. Rwanda. Okay. At the same time, I was doing the bank, and um, and they were with women who were called prostitutes. They were they were just single. They were single mothers essentially, fully second class citizens. Very. Um, shy and um, they had this deep sense of unworthiness and I felt great empathy for their plight. Uh, and so at the beginning, I had the system, you know, we would put all their baked goods in buckets, which they would take into town and they'd go door to door, office to office to sell their donuts or whatever. And then I realized a few weeks later that they were stealing me blind. Um, hmm. And I, you know, I was like, you guys, what is wrong with you? Like, we're building this company together. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And they were like, but you're not checking. <laughs> I was like, good point. From now on, we're going to have a system of credits and debits. And um, and so we started this tough accounting system. That so they, you, stu- you, stuck with, you stuck with them? Oh, I totally stuck with them. Mm-hmm. We quadrupled their – they ended up making four times um, – the average wage in mm-hmm. the city um, after we built this business. It, we were the bad news bears, but we, bit, we built it. But I, from then on, it was trust but verify. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe we should just quickly run through some of the different, because uh, I was struck by the diversity of activities you've, you've kind of invested in. Um, there's, uh, I, and, and, with a lot of these things, they are reminders of things we take for granted that can't be taken for granted uh, in a lot of parts of the world. So one is just toilets, right? Uh, the um, is is the was there the company was uh, is that the Sanergy company or is that's that Sanergy? Yeah. Sanergy. So that was where did that start? It started in Nairobi. I mean, yes, we take it for granted, um, and yet one in three human beings on the planet. Have, have no access to a toilet. Um, so you imagine what that, that, that does. And then the second secondary level of taking that for granted is that what that means is that girls who don't have access to a toilet often will stop going to school when they're menstruating hmm. because they're in high shame societies hmm. and they don't hmm. know, they have no place to go. Um, and so it's a really... It's an obvious thing, but it has implications for all of these other sectors. In a place like um, Nairobi slums, where I have done a lot of work over the last 35 years, um, the the areas are famous for what's called the flying toilet. Um, and that means that because people have no access to anything but latrines that are overflowing, um, most of which have been put down by well-intended uh, charities or aid organizations, um, the the people will defecate on paper inside their homes and they'll throw it onto the roofs outside. So when you're walking through these little helters, you know, skelter little um, alleyways, they're covered in human excrement. It's mm-hmm. quite something. Um, but it makes sense that I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into one of those horrendous overflowing latrines and at least you'd have some privacy, but where do you put it? And so these young entrepreneurs saw the situation. They got super proximate. They studied slums. They also saw the great vibrancy and the entrepreneurship inside the slums. And so they, they, they analyzed the whole marketplace. What elements of toilets have a market Capability so that you could have some level of financial sustainability and what doesn't. And they, they realize that people will use clean latrines. And now we have the technology that where you can have dry latrines, but the issue is you've got to get the waste out. And so they created a system where the waste would be collected on a daily basis. But then what do you do with all that accumulated waste? And so then they decided, well, There's a real resource. Korea developed in large part by using human waste as fertilizer, Hmm. their agricultural sector. And so they built a system where they would lend to individual entrepreneurs who would build these beautiful toilets. I have used many of them. Um, Collect five cents per use. Know their customers. Keep the toilets very clean and have the sanitation 
um, in that the waste was removed on a daily basis. That waste then, and this took a few years, hence the need for patient capital, was converted, is converted to fertilizer, which now has gotten um, health approvals and is sold to uh, smallholder farmers about six dump trucks worth um, uh, every month. It's a quite an extraordinary endeavor what they do. And they're serving about over 100,000 people now. Levels of cholera and other diseases have gone down. School attendance is, is up. People are putting these toilets in their homes, inside bars. It's transformed the community. Um, and now they're in negotiations with the government of Nairobi for what is called off-grid sanitation. Mm -hmm. Um, because the government, you can't even get sewerage into areas like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and there, I mean, there's just a number of kind of stories, uh, like this in the book. I mean, you know, ambulance service, it turns out was very spotty, uh, and inefficient in, in Mumbai. And you, you, uh, invested in a company that, that changed that. Um, and you know, it kind of, I guess the other end of the spectrum, are things like uh, coffee and chocolate. Um, there's one there's, there's a story about each of those. Now, would this, the coffee thing, would that uh, qualify as fair trade coffee? Um, because part of the deal is you were trying to bring the local coffee farmers a better uh, deal than they had gotten, right? Yeah, well, what's so interesting, and this is what makes me very hopeful despite this you know, divided, unequal, um, dangerous time when we think about climate is that there's a new generation of entrepreneurs that are standing on the shoulders of those who did fair trade, et cetera. But instead, Bob, they are, um, they're reimagining capitalism and mm-hmm. they are fearless. So fair trade gave the farmers a slightly better deal, made sure that they weren't fully abused. But still, we're talking 10, 15% premiums for high quality uh, coffee beans and chocolate beans. The new generation who would not have done this without the older generation um, said, you know, when you really get under it, capitalism is so broken because coffee and chocolate are priced at the international commodities level, right? So it's future traders sitting in New York City on Wall Street looking at global supply and demand of coffee. So Brazil is by far the largest producer. Brazil has a bumper crop, meaning they produce too much coffee. Coffee prices go way, way down from, let's say, $3 a pound to $0.99 a pound. Well, who bears that risk? Um, Not the coffee traders. They're hedging their bets. The farmers. And so would be okay if it were just in Brazil and all the farmers had all this. It would be not great, but at least it would be understandable. Farmers in Ethiopia and Colombia, now they're getting paid 99 cents a pound, even though they may be having a scarce Mm -hmm. um, uh, crop that Mm -hmm. year. And so what guys like Tyler Youngblood and others said is, um, wait a minute, we've got a premium market where people are paying $18 a pound in New York City for premium Colombian coffee. Why are we making the poorest farmers in the world take the, bear the brunt of the risk? And so they flip the whole model and they start with the cost to the farmers. What does it take for the farmer to produce about a pound? How much does it cost them? And the second thing they did by getting close to the farmers was to understand that what poor people value, which makes a lot of sense, Yes, his income levels, but equally, they want stability. They want to know in three months that they're going to have cash to continue to pay school fees for their children. Mm -hmm. And so not only did they agree on a fixed price, regardless of supply and global prices, um, but based on their own costs, but secondly, that they would lock it in for a three-year period. At the beginning, that's really hard when the market moves against the farmers. But if you have created fairness based on what it actually costs the farmers, even if psychologically it feels like a loss against the globe, they stay whole. And that's how you start to build communities of trust. And the cool thing is we're seeing it starts with these um, 
these intrepid, crazy entrepreneurs that say we're going to break this, the system and rebuild it. But as they prove the viability, as they prove that these farmers are bringing some of the best quality beans in the world, companies like Stumptown and others are willing to play according to these new rules. And so it starts at the edges, but it gives me great hope that this is how we can reimagine capitalism for stakeholders, not just shareholders in real ways. And that's why at the end of the day, what this book is about is, yes, real tangible examples of how we've seen individuals change entire systems in healthcare, in housing, in electricity, in sanitation, in food and agriculture. But what differentiates those who built wonderful companies and those who change those systems in ways that include the poor is character. This is where the moral revolution comes in because it's a different set of skills than I certainly was taught in business school or anyone that I know was even taught in any of our schools. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's not to say these skills are more important than the competencies that we need to have, but we've got the knowledge and the tools now. What we need is the ability to understand how markets work and, and not be controlled by it and build anyway, how to partner with government and not think, well, they're bad or private sector's greedy, but partner with, this is some of the stuff you talk about in non-zero, that there is a way for us to build a world where everyone can flourish, but we need a new set of skills. Okay, so the the moral revolution you allude to, near the end of the book, I think you 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 call it the moral revolution that is called for by our divided world or something like that, as a response to our divided world. What do you think are the biggest divisions um, that need to be addressed? Um, That's such a great question. At a meta level, this whole book is about integrating all of the different divisions from the the most macro to the most micro. Um, the divisions of, um, what, of, of rich and poor, the divisions of the way we think about nationalism and globalism. Um, it makes no sense just to have a, a world where everyone's nationalist, nor do we only focus on the globe. We have to integrate the two, the for-profit and the non-profit. The idea that there are rich countries and poor countries rather than understand that there's elements of the developed and the developing in each one. And so it's really about integration of these opposing truths and getting comfortable with the fact that we've got to find our way toward a moral framework in which we can all see ourselves. Okay. So identity is a, in part of the book, a big theme. Um, and yeah, well, for that same reason. Yeah. The, how, how, what, what's a way that you run up against identity and the work you do around the world, you know, as a, as a problem, as a, as a source of tension or as a complication? I mean, again, on almost every level, um, religious identity, ethnic identity, racial identity, um, national identity, um, on, and again, even, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, she runs a nonprofit. Uh, I know who's, I know what they do now. I'm like, honey, we might be patient capital, but we are not stupid capital. Um, that, that what we have to understand is to solve our problems. We need to integrate the best of ourselves. We have come to see identity as a weapon to divide us and what we have the capacity if we recognize that all of us carry a multiplicity of identities within us, we have the capacity to call on a one part of our identity as a tool to connect us. And that is the opportunity, again, if we think not in division, but where are those parts of ourselves that can connect us and bring us closer? Mm-hmm. So you mean finding a dimension along which we, we have a commonality? Or, or a common interest or as a starting point, as a starting point. Right. Mm-hmm. So people will say, well, how do you walk into highly traditional Muslim male oriented societies? 
and, um, and succeed in the way that you have. And that always cracks me up um, because it's like, number one, we're all human. Number two, I am sure that even within, I will find the ones where we have a love of poetry or literature or nature, Mm -hmm. um, where if I start with those pieces of my identity, the military, you know, having a military dad, coming from a religious and traditional family, even if I don't consider myself a traditionalist today, Mm -hmm. um, there are many ways I can access a part of myself as a starting point. And then if I keep showing up as myself, I can expand those pieces so that we can have real conversations and cross these Mm -hmm. lines of difference in ways that one another can hear. And it takes time to build trust, but trust is the rarest currency that we have. And once you build it, then you earn the right to say the really difficult to each other. And that's where you get stuff done. Mm-hmm. Now, were you a typical military family in the sense that you moved around fairly often? Mm-hmm. Uh, but mainly within the States? Only within the States until yeah. I left, of course, for college and then my parents and they still had four kids mm-hmm. at home moved to Germany. I mean, the reason I ask is because, I mean, it was the same with me. My, my father had done the, most of the overseas stuff. I mean, he did do Korea while I was alive, but we stayed uh, stateside for that. And, um, but even moving around just within the United States, there was a tremendous amount of cultural variation. And um, I, I kind of think I, uh, that kind of childhood made me attuned, on the one hand, to the importance of cultural differences. Like, you did have to figure out in Fast. each place... What was cool? What wasn't cool? What kinds of language you use and, and, and clothes you wore and stuff? Um, and, and some even significant norms. On the other hand, you, there was discernibly a, just a core human nature. You know, it, there's a sense in which people are the same everywhere. And I, I would imagine that in your kind of in your line of work, people going, if you're taking Americans, American investors, whatever, and taking them to what seems like an exotic part of the world and they're going to have to do business there, I would imagine you can err in either direction. I mean, they, they can, they can, they can uh, imagine the people being more exotic than people ever are in the sense that people are always people, right? But on the other hand, they can also, well, let me tell you an example that that I'm thinking of from the book. It's the case of Malala, who is this famous kind of education activist from Pakistan. She, she, she agitates on behalf of a better education for women. And she's famous. She won the Nobel, uh, I guess, Peace Prize. Um, and you tell a story about, well, a perception of her within her part of the world that I think might surprise, uh, some Americans, uh, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Um, and, and let me be clear. A 17-year-old kid got shot in the head. And instead of deciding, you know, now her life was going to be about taking care of herself, which we would all have understood, decided to become an activist on behalf of all young people. Mm-hmm. She's extraordinary. And if, we, if you ever hear her speak, she understands how to transcend identity like very few I've mm. seen. Um, but as you said, in Pakistan, um, there's a real division as to whether she is um, a hero or um, a CIA-backed agent. And um, I didn't fully understand that. I knew that there were divisions, but I was with a group of young people, and we were talking about genuine elites or, or elites who master um with excellence, like the Navy SEALs would master skills or an Olympian athlete um, or counterfeit elites who are people who are put into positions because of where they were born or to whom they were born or some other form of cronyism. And, uh, and we were going back and forth and I was like, what do you guys think of Malala? And it was like, boom, half the room, counterfeit, genuine. And so, um, Everybody was yelling over each other. And I noticed uh, a, a guy that looked like a traditional person from her, from the North, from her area. And so I stopped the conversation and I said, you know, so-and-so, you seem very agitated. Like, what's going on with you? And he said, 
you know, she's a, she's a CIA backed agent. She's no hero to me. And I said, help me understand. You know, I just started to ask him questions, not to convince him, certainly not to convert him, but just to understand. And, um, and he said, look, I come from her village. Hmm. Swat, the area that she and I are from, was one of the most progressive places in the world, in our country. Girls were always educated. And then the earthquake happened about 10 years ago. And um, the Taliban came down from the mountains and they took over. And now we're in this horrible situation and Malala gets shot. And this works for the Americans because the Taliban are a product of the Americans. Mm -hmm. The Americans are droning my people. And yet here, this one girl gets hit by the Taliban. And now they say, look, it's their fault. And these people, he said, the Americans think are monsters. Whereas I would like to see a young woman who got hit by a drone and survived it raised as a hero. Mm -hmm. And it was such an extraordinary moment to just hear the layers of pain in his identity, that this wasn't about Malala at all. This was the fact that he feels even in his own country, that Pashtuns like him are considered second class citizen. And then in the rest of the world, they're considered from his perspective, um, barely human. And, um, and I don't know who he convinced or didn't convince. It didn't matter. There was a deeper level of understanding um, about identity. And if we could take the time not to decide someone's good or bad based on one perspective, but to, to, to take the time to understand from where those perspectives come and recognize a truth or a half-truth in what they might be saying, and we could open up space to have much more robust, frankly, conversations about very moral issues that we are facing in all of our countries, in all of our businesses, profit and purpose. Um, you know, think about our big political issues. Do you build a wall? Do you have open borders? Both ideas are at the extremes, but we're not having the real conversation about the choices and the costs of either. We're just deciding that one person is bad for being on one side or the other. And that's not good for any of us. And that, and so when I think of the, the leaders, the moral leaders that we all need to become, it, it, it's those people who are willing to listen to the other side and take a step toward them. Doesn't mean you have to give up your position, but hold it a little bit more lightly. Yeah, it's hard. Um, and there's a... Um you, you quote this uh, Lebanese, or Lebanese French writer, uh, Malouf, I mean Malouf. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I think to the effect that identity, um, you know, we all have multiple identities. I, you know, I'm an American. I may have a religious affiliation. I may play golf. I may have a political uh, affiliation. And, and we tend to emphasize more or cling particularly to identities when they seem to be under threat. Is that, is that, is that, am I reading that no, correctly? That's right. Malouf talks about the hierarchy as well. Right. Now we've got all these identities inside us. Um, some we feel more strongly about than others. And it's a great exercise just to take out a piece of paper and write down all of your multiple identities. Mm -hmm. um, but when one identity gets threatened, it rises to the top. And in the case of this young man, when suddenly Malala was on the table, his Pashtun identity got threatened, and that's all he was, even though, as it turned out, he was also an educator. He actually teaches girls, and, um, and he, he's, he's and a father, and he's a son, and he has all these amazing pieces of identity. But in that moment, that's what he was. And so how we see other people can have enormous influence on how they see themselves. Um, and it's, a, and, and for us as well, when we get triggered, it's often because one piece of our identity has been pricked mm -hmm. or threatened. And, um, the more we're aware of that, the more we can start to be better leaders, use it as a tool rather than 
react to everything, respond in ways that, that enable learning um, and so that we can be a better bridge to understanding. Mm-hmm. All of this is hard. That's why it's, it's going to take all of us. Yeah, but it, it's very relevant to our own situation. I mean, if you look at how the polarization happens in the United States, I think often it's people feel that a part of their identity is under threat. They may feel that, uh, you know, uh, being uh, a white working class American is not respected. And, 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 you know, politicians who want to mobilize that sentiment, of course, try to, uh, to accentuate the, the perception that they, that they are disrespected by the other side. And, and it works both ways. Um, it works both ways. And Bob, this, this is, I'm actually glad you said that, that this is, um, I have never really said this out loud, but working in and living in Rwanda and, and seeing up close and personally how easy it is for demagogues to prey on the broken parts of people. And we all have broken parts, every single one of us, shames, petty grievances, in insecure times when we want to blame somebody else. It's just human. Um, we underestimate what terrible things we're capable of doing. And Rwanda had such an enormous impact on me um, because people I loved not only were murdered, but they, in some cases, were part of the planners of the genocide. And so to have worked with people, good people who ultimately do unthinkably horrendous, evil things makes you start to understand that we are strong and invincible and we are fragile creatures. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was so important to me to, to go into the world word moral Because right now, moral has been co-opted as my morality. Hmm. I'm right. That means you must be wrong. I'm a better person. You're a bad person. That's where we've gotten in this individualistic world in which we live. And capitalism unbound doesn't help. But it's just what you're saying. It's really easy to put my right above your right. And I'm not a a relativist. I think you know that. But I am someone who believes that it's only when we have the courage, and I do think this is about moral courage, to hold these tensions Mm -hmm. and help an interdependent world which operates from very different systems of belief and, frankly, truths, navigate them with one immutable, and that is our shared human dignity. And that comes for no other reason than that we are born human. And um, once we let that go even a little bit, that's when really bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seems to me a part of moral imagination, I think as you're defining it, you know, it's a term that's been used in in different ways, but is, would be uh, coming to understand or a result of moral imagination could be coming to understand that however strange someone's belief may seem to you at first, Actually, if you had been born in their circumstances and subject to all the formative influences they were subject to, it might make uh, perfect sense to you. E- even even ideas you find abhorrent. Even ideas you, f- you, you find abhorrent. And to even understand culture and, and without judgment. I remember first working in some cultures, and I would actually put the South in this, and so I'd be interested in your perspective, but where honor was more important even than honesty. And so just don't shame the family. <laughs> if, you, if you have to lie, lie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I work in cultures where the price of dishonoring the family, and, of course, it disproportionately falls on the weak and vulnerable girls, mm-hmm. um, can result in the death of the girls. You know, at, girls the hands of the, at the hands of the family, even. Of their brothers and their fathers and their yeah. uncles in ways that, I, I mean, I, I could never condone. I find it horrendous. But once I understood concepts of honor and honesty, I could see it in my own family. Mm-hmm. I could see it all through in obviously much less severe ways. But suddenly, if the community is that much more important than the individual, often the individual can be expelled. 
if the individual is so much more important than the community, then we don't take care of our weak and vulnerable. And so there's, there's again, it's this tension. How do we build communities, families, and societies where we are willing to do the uncomfortable work of enabling individual choice and freedom within the context of a community that can be diverse and yet also create a sense of belonging. That's the leadership we need right now. And it's not impossible. We have examples in the world. I get to work with young people building companies, but I look at Jacinda Ardern, Angela Merkel. These guys, these women leaders are um, role models in this moment of such crisis for holding the individual and the community. It's not that it's without a cost, but it, um, it inspires those of us who are at times feeling despair that we don't have those kinds of moral leaders because I see them in every society, including some of the ones I just described as um, more complex Mm-hmm. But, um, and that we have we have something to learn from every community in which I have worked. And I gather you see them, uh, you know, assuming diverse forms. In other words, I get the sense that, you know, on the one hand, with the book, you're I was trying to imagine what audience you had in mind. You clearly have in mind people who would like to make the world a better place. But but that encompasses quite a variety of kinds of people, I gather. It, it isn't just people who run NGOs or work at NGOs. It isn't just, you know, do you want to talk? And and also, I mean, has it kind of changed over time? I mean, I will, I will say, just observing college students today, we seem to be at a time, just observing my own daughters, when, I mean, first of all, the, the NGO sector has just gotten bigger. There, there's more kind of opportunities to, 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 sector. to, to get into to nonprofit work. But there is also, I mean, whatever you want to say about social justice warriors and identity politics in a negative way, and some of it can be said, there, there is uh, a degree of, in some sense, idealism that was not there when I was, um, when I was in college, I think. Yeah, oh, I for sure. And in fact, I started, you know, at the beginning of the book, I said, this is a love letter to anyone who dares to make change. When I started writing, I was thinking that this was a letter to the next generation. Um, I was actually thinking about another friend of mine who was murdered um, in a mysterious murder um, for standing up to the status quo. And I, and I, I was thinking, you know, I haven't finished the work she started, nor, and she couldn't finish it. So it's my job now to write a letter to the next generation of everything that I have learned. But then my editor said, um, actually, Jacqueline, this is for me. This is what I want to hold on to. And the more I got into it, the more I thought, well, some of the most mor- morally courageous people I know are actually working inside corporations and they are paying immediate prices by getting fired often for standing up or they're in government. And we're watching people right now get thrown out for um, speaking the truth. Um, and when they do, the rest of us feel, well, most of the rest of us feel like that was a good person. Um, we need more of them. And so what started off as a love letter to young people really has become what I hope could be a set of operating principles for anybody who does want to make change. I wish that there were a silver bullet or a linear fix to the mess we've gotten ourselves in. But um, when criminal justice, food systems, water systems, health systems, capitalism, economic systems, monetary systems – are all broken. The only way that I can understand change is if we start to build a movement of individuals who say enough, a world that, that, that puts profit at the center of everything ends up divided, disgusted, um, 
at great risk of climate catastrophe and way too unequal. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, 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 I'm someone who really loves the ancients. And Aristotle, Aristotle once said that, um, I'm paraphrasing him, but that um, the problem with an, a highly unequal society is that the rich feel above it, the poor feel above, below it. And so you don't have that commons where we see ourselves as part of a common project. And that is where we are in the world right now. And so what will it take? And, and that is, goes back to the, this idea of moral revolution. But it doesn't come from above or below. It has to come from inside every, every one of us. Okay. Well, I, I think that's a good note to end on. But if you want to say anything else about the book, um, this is your, your last chance. We've covered a lot of ground. Well, one, it's just an honor to um, to talk to. Don't wave your head. <laughs> I read Non Zero in the in the either the, I think the early nineteen nineties, and it had a huge impact on me because this was my philosophy. Um, and like so many change makers, uh, people call you idealistic at times, um, naive. And uh, the good news is I think some still are, but the even better news is we have real proof that a non-zero world, a stakeholder world, where we do not have to be fighting tooth and nail for me at the expense of you, but can actually build a world for us, is not only possible, but it's happening. I see a great awakening, and it is um, it is a moral awakening, but even connected to that is that we have the tools, the skills, the knowledge, the technology like never before in history. And so um, game on moral revolution. Well, as we used to say in church, amen. Um, the, uh, you're mentioning idealism reminds me of a little anecdote in the book about how when you're in Africa, I forget what country, but, uh, uh, I, I was in Ghana, but it was a Nigerian. It was a Nigerian man says, "You aren't you too old to be ideal idealistic about uh, Africa?" It's it's uh, clear you're you're not too old to be idealistic in general. Um, so good, uh, and uh, yeah, and as long as that idealism is grounded in pragmatic knowledge, understanding, and the willingness to do the hard work, bring on the idealists. Okay, uh, we encourage them to, to join your cause, to join your crusade. And speaking of which, I mean, let me mention the name of the book again, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Practices to Build a Better World. But is there any anywhere else people can go to get in touch with your, do you have a Twitter handle or anything you want to mention? Or um, At Jay Novogratz on Twitter and on Instagram. And um, we also have a, a master course, Bob, called The Path to Moral Leadership. Anyone who buys the book before May 26 gets this $200 12 week course for free. Mm. And, um, and in it, it gives you the chance, the, 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 the student, the chance to really start to ask themselves some of these questions about who they are, who they want to be, um, how to both find purpose and then live into it. Okay. And so that Twitter handle then is J N is in Nancy O V O G R A T Z. Yes. Okay. So I think we've given given people some uh, coordinates, some places to find you. And thanks so much for taking the time, Jacqueline. You're, you're doing great work, and uh, I I really appreciate it. And I know a lot of other people around the world do too. Well, thank you. It's it, like I said. Um, you're not very good at taking compliments, but I just, I haven't had enough practice. That's the problem. I, it doesn't happen often enough. I'll get better. Uh, but, but, uh, but I appreciate the, the, I appreciate the effort on your part to give me one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.